Welcome to The Authority File. I'm Bill Mickey, your host and the editorial director at Choice. My guest for this series is Dr. Sarah Elaine Eaton. Sarah is the editor of a new book series from Springer Nature called Ethics and Integrity in Educational Contexts. Her first volume, Academic Integrity in Canada, which she co-edited with Julia Christensen Hughes, is out now. She's also the editor-in-chief of the International Journal for Educational Integrity and a faculty member at the Workland School of Education at the University of Calgary. Now, you might hear educational ethics and integrity and think, yeah, we could use some of that, or where do we even start? But we're actually talking about a field of study, one that is multidisciplinary and has lately extended quite far beyond its traditional and more narrow academic integrity days. And that's what Sarah is here to talk about. We'll be looking at how the field of study has advanced to include global perspectives on not just student behavior, but instruction, academic leadership, technology, and importantly, equity. This four-part series is brought to you with support from Springer Nature. In this third episode of the series, Sarah and I talk about some of the most pressing challenges the field of educational integrity is facing today, with a special focus on artificial intelligence and emergency remote teaching brought on by COVID-19. So what are some of the issues that are currently challenging educational ethics and integrity? Like what are some of the top of mind things that you're, you're dealing with uh, these days? I think really currently uh, we're dealing with contract cheating. So during the pandemic, these outside companies, whether they're commercial file sharing companies or uh, companies that complete assignments on behalf of students, we see them taking a fairly aggressive um, marketing approach to our students, reaching out to them on social media platforms like Instagram, TikTok, and other platforms where students are offering to complete their assignments or offering them relief from the stress of uh, completing their work at the end of the semester saying, hey, we can help you. And we try and tell our students, these companies are not there to help you. They are there to empty your your pockets and they do not care if you get called up for academic misconduct, which you will if you hire someone to complete your assignments or sit an online exam on your behalf. And that those things are still not okay, even during emergency remote teaching. Um, but we've seen a real uptick in these companies. And uh, I mean, now we know that this industry is worth we estimate about $15 billion US uh, and that their market is global and they basically have an unending uh, customer line with students cycling in and out of educational programs. So we really need to educate our students that that uh, these companies are not there to help them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just, yeah, I never, I don't want to forget that sort of global perspective. Is this, is this a, a practice that's sort of unique to certain areas or regions or is it pretty widespread? It's completely global, right? And we might yeah. know that, uh, you know, there's one parent company and they might have dozens or hundreds of websites that they localize for some of their marketing. So for example, I did a research project with a, co a colleague in Canada where we found companies that had mirror sites for the US and, and Canada, and they would mm -hmm. say things on the American can cite like we can we can help your child with uh, the sixth grade math curriculum, but then they would change that language on their Canadian site where they had a maple leaf and say we can help your child with the grade six math curriculum. So yeah. as a grade sixth grade for the U.S., grade six for Canada, and that's how we discovered that not only are these companies doing outreach to college kids, but they're also marketing to uh, students as young as about ten years old. Now is that. Ask, is that a new thing in, in terms of targeting uh, younger students? Um... Absolutely. Um, I mean, we know that yeah. uh, these co these companies are out there to make a profit and any new customer yeah. base or line of business is something that they'll go after. We've certainly seen an uptick in marketing to parents in uh, K through 12 education, for sure. And some of these companies, not all of them, we have discovered during the pandemic have added a new line of business, which is um, extortion of students who engage in their services. So here's how that works. A student might once out of, you know, just desperation, say, I'm just going to, I'm just going to outsource this one assignment. And then the company says, okay, we will continue to charge your credit card on a monthly basis until the credit card expires. This is the amount we're going to charge you. Uh, if you refuse to pay, then we will report you to your school for cheating. We will give them all of the information about the assignment that you asked us to complete with your course outline from your school, with your professor's name on the course outline, uh, and then you'll be kicked out of school. So students get caught in the middle, right? And in 2021, in April, the Better Business Bureau actually 
issued a scam alert um, about homework help tutoring companies that extort students for additional money. So we know that this is happening in the US, in Canada, in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and all over the world. Students are often unaware of these risks. Um, yeah. And they don't realize that by engaging in a company once, this com- these companies have all of their data, uh, and then they can do with it whatever they want and continue to generate revenue uh, in whatever way makes sense for the company. And again, not for the benefit of the student. Oh my gosh, is that is is that even legal? Like, how does? Um, it's interesting. Are they just no. do it until they get caught or? Yeah, contract cheating has been made illegal from the supplier side. So it's illegal to operate an academic cheating company or advertise, depending on your jurisdiction, in Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, 17 U.S. states. And a third reading at the time of our interview today has just uh, been undergone in the uh, U.K. Parliament to make contract cheating illegal in the U.K. In my home country yeah. of Canada, it's not currently illegal anywhere. And in the majority of U.S. states, it is not illegal for these companies to operate. Wow. Okay. So how have, how have these challenges evolved over the, over the decades? I'm wondering, you know, just sort of a historical perspective here. Are there specific challenges unique and, you know, like contract cheating, for example, in the, in the last 20 years? Contract cheating is a big one in the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, and we've seen the ways in which the internet has um, changed our understanding of educational ethics, right? And I'm, I would never say that the internet has propagated or facilitated more cheating or plagiarism. There's not much evidence to support that notion, but we have seen mm. the ways in which it has facilitated online business, for example, with contract cheating being one of them. We knew that there were like term paper mills operating, you know, in the eastern seaboard of the United States in the early 70s. But this global operation uh, has really flourished in the past 25 years. So that's one. Uh, And then, I mean, a really recent one that's come out that I think folks would want to have on their radar is the ways in which artificial intelligence technologies are impacting our understanding of what does it mean to write. Um, We've got technologies such as GPT-3 or OpenAI that can write text very easily. So you give it a prompt, you could give it a prompt saying, you know, what does academic integrity mean? And the technology can write a paragraph for you. So I think learning to grapple with what does this mean for students? What does it mean for educators and administrators? And what does it mean to interact with these technologies in an ethical way? I think that's going to be one of the key things we have to look at going forward because we don't have answers to any of that yet. Right, right. So In terms of AI, can you help us understand where that technology comes into play in this field in particular? Like how are, maybe on the supplier side, like where where is this being used and implemented? So, I mean, there's a number of us who study contract cheating who believe that these companies that hire, you know, writers for cheap, basically, um, you know, from other countries, soon those writers could be replaced with artificial intelligence or bots that Mm -hmm. will write the essay on behalf of the students. But That might also put some of these companies out of business because some of these artificial intelligence technologies for writing, like GPT-3, are becoming increasingly available for free. So students might not have to contract out their work if they can simply go online um, and get a bot to write some of their um, essay for them. So just like, like when I was going to school, I can't remember which grade it was, but anyway, calculators were introduced, right? And this was the big controversy. Oh my goodness. This is going to understand, you know, help us, um, you know, corrupt our young people and they won't be able to do math anymore. And this is a travesty. Well, of course, calculators are everywhere in every classroom now. But at the time, it was just considered this terrible disruption to our learning. And I think that artificial intelligence will be to this generation of students and teachers and parents, what tech computers, sorry, what calculators were to my generation. Uh, And parents are going to have a lot to say, teachers are going to have a lot to say, administrators are going to have a lot to say. But honestly, I think it's here to stay. And one of the questions we're going to have to grapple with is how do we do this in ways that are ethical and make sense? We're not there yet. We don't have those answers. Right. Well, also you could, you could easily sort of accuse, uh, you know, technology companies for not really paying attention to ethics and, and, you know, as they're creating these products. They're just sort of trying to get to the market as quickly as possible. And, you know, as they say, breaking things along the way just to, you know, be first to market and so on. So yeah, lots of work there to be done, I suppose. In the case of online instruction, um, you know, we've been doing this for a while now, but 
we, and we've talked about this a little earlier, but COVID has showed that it's not a universal skill or service after all. Um, you know, what new pain points were revealed during the pandemic in this regard? Um, you know, for example, emergency remote teaching, um, you know, and how does this, how does assessment change in an online environment as a follow on to that? Yeah, these, these are great questions. And I really uh, appreciate that you differentiated between emergency remote teaching and online teaching, because online teaching was happening before the pandemic. Uh, I, I've had my career right. mainly focused on online teaching since about 2011. And one of the key things he learned very quickly is you simply cannot transplant um, an in-classroom assessment to an online environment. It requires a whole different way of thinking about how we engage in teaching and learning and online assessment. And also, I mean, in terms of the ethics of all of this, what is ethical assessment in an online environment? I would never dream of giving my students um, a multiple choice quiz, uh, you know, that was a major part of their course mark for the entire semester uh, in an online environment. It, It doesn't make any sense. There's better, more interesting ways, right? right? We think about, um, I think about students in my online classes, we've tried all kinds of things. We've tried assignments using social media. We've tried oral exams. Um, I have colleagues who have, for example, assigned students to create a podcast or uh, create a little video. And there's lots of interesting and engaging ways to um, have students show what they've learned um, more than, okay, what have you memorized or what have you consumed in terms of content? But rather, how do we engage students to demonstrate what they've learned in ways that are really exciting and fresh and innovative? Mm -hmm. And then what about the assessment component? And this is a key piece of it, right? So this yep. requires us as educators to think in new and innovative and fresh ways about assessment because, you know, I can set my online exam quiz to just mark those multiple choice quizzes, um, you know, very quickly. And I don't have to be present as an educator, but if I'm going to assign to my students that they have to, you know, create a podcast, that means I have to listen to the podcast and have assessment criteria. And I have to understand as an educator what makes a good podcast and, uh, you know, have Mm. those expectations for my students. So it requires educators to think and be engaged in their own professional practice around assessment and then, you know, rethink what, uh, what might be interesting and innovative for students because doing things like having my students create a podcast Well, that was not an option that was available to me when I was a student because podcasts didn't exist then. And I know I'm dating myself when I say that, but it's really incumbent upon us as educators to think about meeting our students where they're at uh, in the 21st century rather than trying to assess them only in the ways in which we were assessed back in Mm. the day, whenever that might have been. Right. Um, So what are, sticking with COVID for now, what are some of the ways uh, it's the pandemic has revealed or even accelerated ethics and integrity issues specifically? Yeah, I think one of the things we've seen is this intersection between, um, you know, student stress levels um, and academic integrity breaches. Uh, we, we knew long before the pandemic that stress was one of the factors that could lead students to engage in misconduct. So we've seen surge periods, you know, exam periods, there was more cheating. Um, but now yep. we've been living in sustained and perpetual stress for a long time. Um, and we don't yet have a whole lot of data around how this is affecting students. But we're, you know, we're seeing anecdotally that most schools have reports of increases in academic misconduct. So uh, mm. you know, if someone's working at a school where they have this, it's not a sign that the school has failed in any way, because this is a global trend. We're seeing it, you know, across the United States, Canada, and other countries and continents that um, I think in the same way that COVID has shown us the cracks in our broader society, for example, long-term care for seniors, COVID has also right. shown us the cracks in our educational society. And how do we need to do better are the big questions we're grappling with now. You just heard from Dr. Sarah Elaine Eaton. Sarah is the editor of a new book series from Springer Nature called Ethics and Integrity in Educational Contexts. Her first volume, Academic Integrity in Canada, which she co-edited with Julia Christensen Hughes, is out now. She's also the editor-in-chief of the International Journal for Educational Integrity and a faculty member at the Workland School of Education at the University of Calgary. Join us next week when we zoom out on educational ethics for a global perspective on policy and governance. We'll also talk about how librarians are uniquely positioned to provide services in support of these efforts. This four-part series is brought to you with support from Springer Nature. 
Oh, I think librarians are the unsung heroes of academic integrity. And libraries themselves can serve as a hub for academic integrity and educational ethics on campus, right? Not only because, I mean, traditionally libraries are intellectually agnostic and judgment-free when folks walk through the door. Uh, and then that way the students can have safe conversations with librarians and library staff about how to cite, how to reference, but also librarians can go beyond that um, to talk with students about things like contract cheating uh, and through things like uh, digital citizenship and understanding the perils of connecting with contract cheating companies. I think librarians uh, play a huge role, not only for skills training, but also helping students become advocates and agents of their own learning. If you like what you hear, rate us or give us a review on your podcast platform of choice. As always, sponsorship and advertising for the Authority File podcast are handled by Choices Advertising Manager Pam Marino, and all of our episodes are produced and edited by Choices Digital Media Producer Sabrina Kofer. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.